Hi, welcome to Louise's Bible Study again. Several things have come up this past week. I saw a commercial on TV, and I love the ministers, but the commercial is real wrong. And I also had my husband tell me something somebody said, and I want to correct this deception that's out there. You know, people are always saying, why do bad things happen to good people? Why do we have tornadoes? Why does God, God, God allow hurricanes? Why does God allow my house to burn down? Why does God allow uh, uh, wars and cancer and people dying of the coronavirus and plagues? And if he's such a good God, why does he allow these things to happen? What in the world? What, what is he thinking? Why is he doing this? And I want to set the record straight because if this is your thinking, you don't know my God. And you need to get to know my God. Because my God is very, very loving. And, and, and I'm going to start with a scripture that Jesus had in John 10, 10. He drew the line in the sand. He said, the thief, meaning the devil, the thief, Satan, comes only to steal, kill, and destroy. I want you to write that down. John 10, 10. Satan comes to kill, steal, and destroy. I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. So Jesus is saying very, very specifically here that he did not kill, steal, and destroy. Satan kills, steals, and destroys. How do we know that? Well, let's start at the beginning. In Genesis, when uh, Adam, who was given commission over this whole world, this, this, this beautiful earth that we have here, and he committed high treason, and he basically sold the whole thing out to the devil. And God is legal. I don't know if y'all realize that, but God is very legal, and he stands by his word, and he had given Adam the authority in this earth, and it was Adam's place if he wanted to turn that authority over to Satan, and he did. Now, why he did that, I don't know. It's going to be one of the first questions I ask when I get to heaven. But in the meantime, we've been left with the disaster that Adam created. And when that happened, a curse came upon mankind and a curse came upon this earth. And Satan became the god of this world. We need to understand we live in this earth, but Satan has a lease on this earth that was given to him by Adam and the lease will be up at the end of the mo uh, of the tribulation and then at the end of a thousand years of, of the millennial Satan will be turned loose for a short time period and then after that he is going to be put under the earth forever but right now he has a legal right here and if he didn't when he came to tempt Jesus, the temptation would not have been real. How could he say to Jesus, look, I, I own all this. It's mine, and I'll give it to you if you'll just bow down and worship me. And Jesus said no. He quoted the word. Satan had the right to offer him that. It was his. If Satan is the god of this world, then the things that happen in this world are not God's doings. They are Satan's doings. Well, then you say, well, what about, what about God? Well, then let me tell you about God. God is love. And, and I love this scripture in James. James says here, uh, the Amplified Bible reads it so good. Every good thing given and every perfect gift is from above. It comes down from the Father of lights, the creator and sustainer of heavens, in whom there is no variation, no rising or setting or shadow cast by his turning, for he is perfect and never changes. The bottom line here, friends, is God is love. And God sent his only son into this earth to, to win back for us what Adam had lost. Jesus became the second Adam, and he walked out for three years his ministry on this earth, 
in, in several different ways. And one was that he was doing what the first Adam failed to do. And when he went to the cross, he was perfect, spirit, soul, and body, because he was born of a virgin and of the Holy Spirit. He did not have the sin nature in him. The first Adam did not have the sin nature in him until he committed high treason and turned against God and became spiritually dead. And when Jesus went to the cross, he took on our sin nature. He took on our spiritual death. He took on our penalty for healing. He took on our penalty for sickness. He took on our penalty for poverty. He died as a man, and he rose again and sits at the right hand of the Father. And Jesus has the authority that he beat Satan when he went to hell, and he overcame him. And when he arose from hell, he gave us authority. He gave us authority in his name. Once you're born again and you are a spirit-filled Christian of God, a child of God, you have moved from darkness into light. God didn't take you out of this demonic world. He didn't take us out of this, this satanic ruled world. He left us here. We are called ambassadors for Christ. You know why God left us here? Because he wants us to walk out in front of the world what Jesus Christ is. He wants us to show others what God is. That God is love. You know, it's so easy to blame someone else in our utter ignorance. But when we realize that what, what the failures that have taken place in this earth have been, have really, a lot has fallen on the shoulders of the church. Because we have not been preaching the true gospel. We have not been preaching our authority that has been given to us in the name of Jesus. And we do have authority in this earth. You know, uh, there are a couple of scriptures here. I love this. It says, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power. Power. He went about doing good and healing all. This is, this is Acts 10, 38. And I want you to read this and meditate on it because it's, he went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil for God was with him. If you look in the scriptures in Matthew, if you start in the scriptures in Matthew, I want to read to you uh, Matthew 4, 23. And Jesus went about all Galilee, teaching in their synagogues, preaching the gospel of the kingdom, and healing all kinds of sickness and all kinds of disease among the people. You know, there's a scripture here that I love. It's one of my favorites, too. It says where, you know, when Jesus began his ministry, uh, uh, he says that there, there was a leper. And if you look at Matthew 8, um, I think it, I actually have a better rendering of this in Mark. Uh, I was, I lost it. No, no, I did kind of lose it. Wait a minute. But anyway, Matthew 8, uh, there was a leper that came to Jesus, and he said to him, he said, And behold, a leper came, and he worshipped Jesus, saying, Lord, if you are willing, I think that's a word here we need to, if you are willing, you can make me clean. And then Jesus put out his hand and touched him, saying, I am willing, be cleaned. And immediately his leprosy was gone. What verses are those? That's uh, Matthew chapter 8, verse 1, 2, 3, and 4. Okay. What is Jesus saying here? The leper is saying to, to Jesus what the religious world says to us all the time. The religious world says all the time, well, we know God is able. I mean, God is a creator of all. We, we understand that. We, we worship a great and mighty God. We know God. Nothing is impossible with God. But I'm not all 
always sure God is willing to deliver me from this situation. I'm not sure God is always willing to take me out of this sickness or pain. The leper asked that question and he came to Jesus and he said, I know you can do this. What I want to know, are you willing? And Jesus' immediate answer was, give me your hand, I'm going to heal you. Of course I'm willing. That's what I'm here for. Isaiah 53, if you want to look at that, is the atonement. That's what took place in the atonement on the cross. And Isaiah 53 says, starting with verse 4, Surely he hath borne our griefs. That's the, the word griefs there. If you want to, if you really want to study the truth, then look it up in the Hebrew because this rendering did not render it properly. And in the Hebrew, that word griefs is sickness. Sickness. Physical sickness. It doesn't say spiritual sickness. It's physical sickness. He bore our sickness and carried our sorrows, that's infirmities, yet we esteemed him stricken. Smitten. Stricken there means that he carried our sorrows and our pain. You know, God never intended for any of us to be in pain or sickness. He never. It, Jesus right here bore it on. He bore it on the cross. And he says, he, but he was wounded for our transgressions, our spiritual sins. He was bruised for our iniquities, our sins. The chastisement for our peace. If you want peace with God, he bore it. And by his stripes, we are healed. You know, religious people like to say, well, that means spiritual healing. No, that's not talking about spiritual healing. That's talking about physical healing. Jesus bore all of our physical pains because all of that was under the curse. That was the curse that came upon man through Adam. And the Bible says that Jesus bore our curse, that we do not have to bear that curse. So why do you want to go crucify Jesus all over again? Every time that you blame God for this stuff, you're just putting Jesus back on the cross. He already did everything he needed to do for you. He's given you all authority. He gave you an armor that you need to put on. And he, he gave you weapons to use against the enemy. Satan, the Bible says Satan is like a roaring lion. You know, he's, he's coming to eat your dinner. And the biggest thing he has against the body of Christ is our ignorance. What you don't know will kill you. Because if he can lie to you and get you to buy that lie, he can steal from you. He can destroy you. He can kill you. You say, well, but wait a minute. I thought God has given you, you, authority over Satan. He is under your feet. But if you don't choose to operate in his word, if you don't choose to get to know his word, if you are allowing yourself to just... Uh, buy out anything that anybody wants to preach from the pulpit without backing it up from solid scripture, God's not going to stop you. You're free to do that. You can do that. Recently, I had a hand injury. Let me explain to you something. In the Old Testament, it always says, you know, well, God put this on Egypt or God put this on blah, blah, blah. God didn't put anything on anybody because God is good and there is no evil in God. It is impossible for God to put any sickness, any disease, or any harm on anybody. He didn't originate it, and he does not put it. But I'll tell you what he will do, and I'll tell you real quick. He will allow it. There's a big difference there. You see, there's a difference from coming in and putting it on you and allowing it to be on you. Sometimes our ignorance of what we don't know allows Satan to steal from us and we just accept whatever comes along. That's our responsibility. That's our fault. But recently, I'm going to give you an example of allowing it. I had gotten out of God's will. I am a minister 
and I and and I had gotten away from doing what God had called me to do, which one of them is these teachings on iPod or whatever you call this on YouTube. And also, I minister in the church, and I also minister at jail, and I have a Bible study. And I had gotten a little bit out of order because I had, and I know you're going to go tennis lessons, Louise. We're too poor; we don't even minister what tennis lessons are. But just give me a give me a break here because I do take tennis lessons. I love tennis. It was a way for me to get physically back in shape after I had had COVID. And I had allowed COVID, by the way, to come in on me too. So in both instances, God didn't do that to me. It was my personal responsibility. That's another story. But getting over this, I had started taking tennis lessons because it was a way of building my lungs up, my stamina up. And, you know, God loves us. He wants us to do things that we are enjoy. It got out of hand. I found myself taking lessons upon lessons upon lessons upon lessons, and I found myself involved in one tennis team after another tennis team. And not only was I getting involved in the tennis teams, but I was getting involved in the strife, and I was getting involved in the, the, the um, things that didn't add to my life spiritually, were beginning to take a toll on me. I was trying to convince myself and God that this was okay even though I came home exhausted and I didn't have time to pray and I didn't spend time in the Word studying and everything. Oh, but but I convinced God that this was good because I was doing God's will. How? I was sowing to the flesh. And I had gotten out of God's will for what He had called me to do. And suddenly my hand, my tennis hand, my wonderful right hand began to look like a claw. And it hurt so bad, I couldn't open it up. And, um, and I prayed about this. And I said, I've been redeemed from sickness and pain. and every He says, yeah, you have, Louise, but you know what? You opened the door by your disobedience and not listening to me. And when you open that door just a crack, Satan comes in. He's a roaring lion. Remember? He's crafty. And he will come in with any crack you give him. And he will do his best to stop you in your tracks. And he did. And it was a wake-up call for me. And I repented. And I said, God, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I got out of line. I allowed my flesh to take over. And when I got that right, and I got into the scriptures, and I began standing on the word, and prayed, and I knew that I was healed, and it has not been an overnight healing, it has been a gradual healing, which actually has been a lot more productive in my life than it had happened instantly, because by being a gradual, I've had to stand fast, I've had to hold, hold fast to my word of confession, of healing, I've had to stay in the scriptures. I've had to watch my words that come out of my mouth. I've had to do the things that I was letting slide. How bad do you really want to walk in wholeness? It's up to you. And you got to start with judging your own self. Where are you opening the door? Sometimes we do right things and we get persecuted for righteousness sake. That's one thing. The world will persecute you for righteousness sake. I have been undermined. I've been aligned. I've had lies told on me just recently. I've had people malign my character behind my back. I know about it. I know it because I, God gives you a spirit of, uh, of discernment. discernment. And I, I can read it. I can read it all over them. But you know what? God says, I want you to stay out of it. Keep your mouth shut. I will defend your reputation. You do what I tell you to do, and I'll take care of the other. But you can count on it. You're going to get persecuted. But the kind of persecution when it comes to physical pain and sickness, God didn't put that on you. That's strictly from Satan. And because all these... Uh, end time events are taking place. God warned every one of us about them. He said in Timothy, Paul said, these things are going to happen. There are birth pains that are taking place in the earth today and they're getting faster and faster and faster 
until the rapture takes place and the church is removed from here. And it has nothing to do with global warming. That's a, that's the biggest lie from Satan that I've ever heard. They really sold your bill of goods on that one. You know, you hear people talk about this and you want to go, that's, that's stupidity gone to seed. God did not create global warming. Hello, people. If anything, the earth is cooling down. But all these different things that are taking place are happening because we are in a countdown mode until Jesus calls us home and before the rapture of the church and the tribulation takes place. And if you think it's bad now, you don't want to be around when the, when the tribulation takes place because it's going to be the worst period of time, Jesus said, that this earth has ever known. And unless God was to cut it short after the seven years, there would not be one human being left on this earth. But what I am saying to you is I want to justify one thing. My Father is a God of love. It is impossible for him to do anything harmful. But there are two things, remember. If you're persecuted for righteousness sake, that's one thing. But it's not sickness. God does not put sickness on you. Persecution for rightness sake can be come from people. But you're persecuted by the enemy just for the very fact that you're a Christian. And you have a target on your back. And Satan wants to take you out. And he is looking for any opportunity. And when you open that door by your ignorance of what your authority is that has been given to you in the name of Jesus, and you speak words that are death and unbelief, how many words have you said, oh, that's just killing me. Oh, the flu season's coming. I'm going to catch the flu. Really? You sure are because you just opened the door by the words of your mouth saying, come on in. I want to catch the flu. Who wants to catch the flu? You think Satan's got some sort of clock going on over there saying, okay, in October, blah, blah, we're going to start the flu up. People, think about it. You're entrapped by the words of your mouth. The things that you say can be life and they can be death. You can speak life or you can speak death. You can say what God says about you. You know, there were days when, when the pain in my hand was so bad, but I kept saying, I know that my God has healed me the minute I prayed. I'm rejoicing in my healing. I am not moved by my symptoms, Satan. I am walking out my faith. I'd go out and take a tennis lesson. Do you understand that we have a position in Christ that we have never tapped into as a body? And if we had, a lot of the things that are going on in this earth today wouldn't be taking place. I'm going to give you one final example and then I'm going to go... We had a tornado that came through our neighborhood. I don't care if some of you remember that. 2011. 2011. I was sitting out on our front porch that morning, and I was praying in the Holy Ghost, and it became very intense. And after it was over, I said, Lord, what was that all about? That was really intense. And he said, just wait and see. That afternoon, that tornado came right after our neighborhood, and it headed dead center for our house. And when it was over, I want you to know this. We did not have one shingle off our roof. We had one window cracked because a tree limb hit it. We did not have one piece of furniture on our front porch moved. Our poor dog that we had forgotten about was in his doghouse and still there, did not move. We had no damage to our home. We had other homes around us that were obliviated completely. And yet we walked out of that. We had 100 year old oak trees that could have fallen on our house, but instead they went sideways, completely missed our house, completely. Some people say, well, how did that happen? I prayed. I prayed. I listened to God. 
You see, the Holy Spirit wants to warn you of things that are about to happen. And if you'll listen up, you can take authority and you can pray in the Spirit against the things Satan has headed your way. And I pray and Satan did not have the victory. God delivered us. He put angels around our house. So let me tell you something. You need to think twice before you start blaming God for your pain and your sickness and other things. If you have questions in these matters, you can you can um, text them to me through this um, video. video. And I'd be love to answer them, or you can call me up. But but let us let us please not uh, give Satan victory in an area that he does he doesn't deserve. Okay, God is good. I want to know. I want you to know that He loves you. He loves you. He sent the most precious thing that He had to the cross to die for you, and there's not a greater love than that. Why would He send His Son to the cross to die for you, and then want to take you out with sickness and pain and cancer and devastation? He doesn't. If He did, I'll put it this way: He's schizophrenic. And I don't serve a schizophrenic God. I serve a God that is so awesome. I love you. Bye-bye.